Michael Gomez, and I'm a real estate broker and an investor here in Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm Seth Mosley, Grammy award-winning songwriter and real estate investor. We host a monthly meetup in Middle Tennessee for anyone who wants to build passive income, not only for retirement, but for today. On the first Wednesday of every month, we bring in an expert from every area of investing to help you with things like finding deals, getting your financing locked in, asset protection, every kind of investing, so much more. Our videos are all about delivering that content to you. Go to musicandmoneyig.com for more info on our free monthly events. Hit subscribe on the page so you don't miss any awesome content and hit that like button if you like it. Don't let all the fur on my jacket distract you. Here's the content. Around. We've got a powerhouse with us tonight. We've got Adrian Dorison. Adrian Dorison of Run Like Clockwork. She is the CEO and co-founder of Run Like Clockwork. She is a consultant and trainer. She, her strengths, I love this on our website. It says she's an achiever, a, she's futuristic, and she's a relator. And her metric, her key metric is sales. And we're going to learn more about that in her talk. Um, but Adrian has taken the principles of clockwork, which is an amazing book. An amazing, amazing book. In fact, I'm going to just uh, make a little plug before we announce her. Here we go. Sorry, my Zoom is freaking out on me a little bit. Y'all see me? Can y'all see this? Yeah. All right, here I am. So this is the book. This is one of the best business books I've read of all time. Uh, and this was the book that turned me on to Adrian Dorison. And I'm so excited that she's with us tonight. She has taken the principles of clockwork of this book and created Run Like Clockwork to enable passionate leaders to step up and achieve more while doing less. And she's supported by a team of consultants, trainers, and believers in the power of smart, efficient operations. So without further ado, I would love to welcome to the virtual stage tonight, all the way from Florida, we've got Adrian Dorson. Hello, can you hear me? Got you yeah. great. Oh, it's so funny because I have my Peloton back here. Uh, <laughs> of course you do. I was like, definitely got the, I don't have a cool of a background as you guys, but because I got kicked out of my office for my baby's nursery. So now we got a Peloton that we're in the we same room. We have been there. <laughs> I'm sure, I, I, I know Seth uh, feels me on the <laughs> all my baby woes over the past couple months, but I'm excited to be here virtually, just put my baby to bed, so this is perfect. Um, loved hearing, you know, the intros and what you guys are doing, and last minute, Mike, we're going to have uh, a good little training here for you, because <laughs> yeah. um, regardless of what your business is, this stuff applies, and my biggest plug is going to be the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. It's all in this book, and I think that books are one of the, the best self-development, business development tools that are so affordable for you to invest in, and, if, and everything that we talk about today, plus a ton more, I obviously don't have time to read you the whole book tonight. Um, is inside this book, Mike lays out the framework step by step. If you want to, to put clockwork into practice, get the book, do the work. If you want more support, that's what our team does. Um, so we equip small business owners of all different types to design a business that can run effectively without them. So if that sounds appealing to you, this is gonna be helpful for you. Um, and what do I mean by it can run without you? It means that your systems and your team is like locked and loaded so that everything can run and you can step away from the business. So I'm going to share some slides today too. Uh, yeah. Let me just make sure we're good there. You guys can see. Yeah. Cool. cool. Okay. So Mike is my, my business partner um, on Run Like Clockwork. He's the co-founder, but he's the author and you won't see him inside of our business because we've effectively clockworked him out of it right so he has gone on to write the next book it actually came out last week so he has already written the next book which is called fix this next um, and he's working on the one after that so his like highest value to our company is writing that next book he needs to be writing and he needs to be speaking and if i find him doing anything other than those two things 
it's not good for the business, right? So that's a that's a like a, a signal to me that we gotta we gotta fix the operation a little bit. So he's my co-founder, um, but I essentially run the day-to-day company, the team, um, and I have also clockworked myself. So I am also now non-essential <laughs> to the business. Um, in this time of COVID, I have been a little bit more essential because I do think a team needs a leader. And I think that that's my greatest role. And I think that that should be your greatest role is leading the company and the team. So I will you know, speak to some of those things too. Um, I'm obsessed with my dog, as you can see his picture here. I'm a new mom. Um, My background is in Lean Six Sigma. Small business efficiency is what I've transitioned into over the past six years. But I used to do this in in large manufacturing corporations. I used to work actually in the pulp and paper industry, which is one of the largest and most complex supply chains that you can deal with, all the way from a landowner selling you a tree to you know, shipping out a piece of toilet paper that will eventually end up in your house, right? So all of that in between, it was my role to figure out how can we be even more efficient with the work that we're doing here at this really large scale. Now I work mostly with fast growth startups, solopreneurs, entrepreneurs of all different types. So clockwork is all about preparing you for life events so that your business can still run and even grow without you being there. And we wrote the book with the intention that you as the as the business owner would take this four week vacation. So we talk about this idea that you as the business owner need to leave the business totally unplugged for four weeks consecutively. And we want you to take a four week vacation. That's just kind of like the carrot we dangle for our business owners uh, to kind of get you out of the way because that's how we can test if this is working or not. Did the clockwork principles work? Can you effectively remove yourself from the business and things will still run and grow without you? But really this is about life events that I think we're being hit with one right now that many of us were maybe unprepared for. And that's the same thing with clockwork. Whether you're planning a vacation, a maternity leave, or you know, uh, unfortunately a sickness Sometimes people want to start another business. They're like, I have all these business ideas and I don't have time to do them. Or they want to make more money and they're like, I'm just getting in my own way right now because I'm the bottleneck to more growth. Um, Or the rainy day, they're like, I never predicted that, you know, my parents were going to get ill and they were going to need me to support them. And now I've got this business that fully depends on me. Um, or like me, like maybe you just want to spend more time with your family. Maybe you're feeling like I've invested so much time, energy into this company. And I I want to, I want, I did that because I wanted to have more time with my family and removing yourself from the day to day is how you do that. So this is my little family just, you know, before we had the baby snapshot, but context is that my husband also used to be uh, a consultant inside of our company as well. And he got Lyme disease last year. So or two years ago. So we clockworked him out of the business first, because if you have ever known anyone with Lyme disease, if you've ever had an autoimmune, it like takes you out. And I just thought that my husband was getting really lazy, like not even joking. I was like, why can he not like show up to work and like do a few things? (laughs) Like it was, it was crazy how, how detrimental this was to his day to day. And then finally, like six months later, we got this diagnosis, turns out he had Lyme disease. So we clockworked him out of the business. Now we got the baby, I clockworked myself out of our business. Um, So my team, like I said, ran the company without me even checking in, no Slack, no phone calls, no emails, nothing for four weeks. They make all the decisions, they support the clients, they do everything that needs to be done without me. And that is possible for you too. So regardless of your motivation for removing yourself from your business, the first step is understanding where your most valuable resource is going right now. And so I'm going to give you a couple uh, ways to do this, but if you can just guess it, it's not money, right? It's your time. Where is your time actually going? And this is the metric that we start with, with all of our clients. We have this um, uh, framework called the 4D mix, which I'm going to talk you through. It's the first step inside of our system um, because there's four different work types that we have, that we have identified and we classify them in the book. So Doing is when you're actually doing a task, right? You're the one executing the task. 
deciding is a work type that we uh, coined for the book because we noticed that a lot of people thought they were delegating, but what they were actually do is they were assigning team members, contractors, I'll use the term team members, but I mean contractors, full-time, part-time, anyone, your mom, anyone who does work for your business, doesn't really matter to me. Um, anytime they're supporting you in the business, they're a team member, okay? So deciding happens when you are assigning a task to a team member, but then they can't move forward beyond that task without asking you more questions, right? So you still own all the decisions. So that's a really big distinction between delegating and deciding. Deciding means you still own the decision. So they're going to go and they're going to do the task and then they're going to come back to you and they're going to go, Hey Seth, uh, I finished this thing. What do we, what do you want me to do next? Or, Hey Mike, um, I finished this thing, but would you want this in red or black? Right. Or I'm trying to work on this, but I can't really figure out um, how you want this laid out. All of these are deciding. And most of us as entrepreneurs start building a team because we've maxed ourselves out and we're like, oh, we just need to hire a team. That'll make my life so much easier. But what it usually does is make your life a lot harder in the beginning because you're trapped in this deciding phase. And deciding is really energetically and neurologically taxing, right? So if you've ever at the end of the day been asked this question, I know I have, <laughs> um, and it like frustrated you to no end like what's for dinner it's like I don't really care what's for dinner like I'm gonna eat a bowl of cereal you do you whatever whatever like I really don't care what's for dinner right and it's not that this question is so hard it's just that at the end of the day when you've made 47,000 other decisions for other people your brain is neurologically taxed to a point where you can't answer another question you've, you've used up all of your good decision making you know power and you, your decision-making power actually wanes throughout the day, right? It gets worse and worse. And so we want to, as CEOs, as entrepreneurs, we need to make sure that we're using our decision-making power for the most important decisions, not is this thing need to be red or black or what do you want me to do next or what's for dinner, right? Like have someone else figure that out. But also we end up like, taking this question out or taking out our negativity on the people we love the most because at the end of the day they're just getting what's left over of us which is so sad and that was happening to me in my own personal life like he was getting the worst of me my husband and that didn't feel good you know these are some direct quotes from some of our clients so i just wish my team would read my mind and stop asking me so many questions <coughs> excuse me or I've been going nonstop, but I can't name one thing that I've actually accomplished, right? So you're working all day, but not actually getting any of your own work done. And your work should be the most valuable work to the business. So if this is happening, this is stunting the growth of the business. If you're not able to spend your time on the highest value things. Or I've made 407 decisions today, but I haven't got any of my own work done. And I'm still really exhausted. Like, what is that about? Like, I didn't even do anything. Why do I feel so tired? It's like, because you're making decisions all day long, right? So decisions are exhausting. We've clarified that. But that also makes a ton of sense why team members are passing them off to you. <laughs> because they're exhausting. So why would they want to do it, right? It's neurologically taxing for them to make a decision. And so they've been, you know, trained inside your company that you want them to come to you to ask the questions, you want to own those decisions. So they're continuing to come to you because it's also safer for them in their role to pass the questions off to you. Like think about that from an employee mindset. Well, if I make the wrong decision, I could get fired. If I make the wrong decision, maybe my family is not going to eat next week because I, I'm not going to have any money, right? Like I'm going to lose my job or they're going to get mad at me or I'm going to get, you know, demoted or whatever. So these decisions are challenging for them because we haven't properly delegated them over. And I'm going to give you some tools for that today. So the other two D's that we talk about in the book, so we've got doing, we've got deciding, which is the most important one for you to understand here today. We've got delegating. And this is the other really important one where you are assigning an outcome to someone, right? So when we assign a task, that means we still own the decision. When we assign an outcome, we are giving them decision-making power within that area of operation or within that project area or within their entire role to say, 
this is the outcome that I'm looking for. Don't really care how you get there. Or if you do care how you get there, you're giving them the system for that. Um, and they are responsible for all of the decisions within that area to achieve that outcome. So most of us, if we think about our current teams, you probably could identify that maybe we haven't clarified that your, your team members roles outcomes. Like maybe you don't even know what the outcome is that you're looking for from them. And so that's a really good place to start is like, if you don't even know really what the outcome is that you want them to be achieving, go back and clarify that for the, like with them and communicate it because they probably don't know and they probably don't have permission to pursue it. Um, if you haven't communicated what it actually is or the direction you want them to go. And then the fourth work type is designing. And this is all about the creating of the future. This is the visionary. This is the strategy. This is the, like, the, the, the business development side of things, right? The mentorship that maybe you're doing with your team members. But this is usually the most important place for our CEOs to spend the bulk of their time. And when we do our time tracking exercises, they're not spending a whole ton of time here. <laughs> so if you're listening and watching today and you're like, yeah, I'm not doing enough design time, that's normal. But our goal is to start shifting you towards a ton more design time. You're probably doing a lot of doing, a lot of deciding, maybe not as much delegating as we need and not as much designing as, as you desire or need to do. So the way that we identify where your time is actually going is a time tracking exercise. So we use this spreadsheet. I'm happy to send it over, Seth, if you want to send our, you know, we share this with our clients, but happy to send it over to you guys um, because it populates the math for you, which is great. Um, but we have our clients track their time for five full days. I want to know everything they're doing for those five days down to the minute, if possible. And then they classify it by the work type that it is, right? So we just talked about that deciding, doing, delegating, designing, and they put the time. So start and end, and then it auto calculates that, that stuff for you. We're going to talk about the, the three T column there as well in a minute, but this is how we get the data. So just like you have financial data in your business, you also have data that is just as important about where that time is going because your time is money and we need to start moving it in the right direction. So this is the main way that we need to collect that data. Now, for those of you who are, are going to resist me, which I get a ton of resistance on this time tracking exercise, people are like, no thanks, don't wanna do it. I'm like, okay, well, we have to. <laughs> if you're a client of mine, we have to because it is so incremental in shifting things off your plate, but we've created a shorty version for you, like a, a you know, a little hack if you want to just get it done so you can start maybe seeing some traction and that might motivate you enough to do the time tracking. Um, but what I want you to do is I had a client do this recently and, and that's where I, I stole this idea from, from a client. Um, they had just finished a big promotion in their business. They launch uh, e-commerce products and they spent an entire week kind of debriefing that launch, looking at all the numbers. And one of the things that they did is they had two big whiteboards on the wall, their co-founders. And they put one whiteboard with the word dream, like our dream list, and then another whiteboard with like the what are we doing list, right? Because they've had this list of goals and dreams and dream projects that they've wanted to work on for years that keep getting pushed to the back burner, back burner, back burner. So after this launch, they were like, all right, that's enough. <laughs> like, let's really clarify what these dreams are. So I want you to identify like, and put them on a big whiteboard or on a sheet of paper. Like, what are the things that I really wish I was spending my day doing? What are the things that I really dream of doing? The, the dream projects, the things that um, haven't come to fruition yet because I haven't had enough time or I keep pushing them to the back saying it's not time for these things. And then I want you to create a list of all the things you're doing throughout the week, right? Just brain dump it as much as you possibly can. Um, obviously it's not going to be perfect because we're not doing a like moment by moment time tracking, but you can probably get a really good chunk of things on that doing uh, board. And you're going to list out all the things that you're doing. And this is going to give you some really good data because the things that are on that doing board, those are the things that are keeping you from doing the things that you're dreaming about, right? So it's a direct link of like, okay, if we want to move more energy towards the dream board, we got to start shifting some of these doing 
tasks off of your plate. So that's going to be one of your first action steps. I'm like, it really important to me that you don't just watch this training, but you actually do something with it. So I want you to either track your time for five days. I'm going to send you guys the spreadsheet or you're going to do the white whiteboard shortcut version right away. You can do that tomorrow pretty easily. Right? So that's going to give you a really good data set of what do we actually need to start shifting off of your plate? Because this is how we start clockworking the business, right? So now that you have identified, okay, here's, here's what we've got. Here's where our time is actually going. We can see it pretty clearly on the paper, the time tracking or the whiteboards, but there's only four things that we can actually do with that time to start clockworking your business and moving it in this direction of spending more time on the dreams. So when you look at that list of all the things that you're doing, one of the things you can do with tasks is you can trash them. So we have this three T methodology. And the first T is you can trash it. And what do I mean by that? I mean, I really want you to question everything on that list. Like, do I really need to do this? Like, does this move the business forward? And if not, can we just trash it? Most of the time we continue to do things just because we've always done them. This was the, like my arch nemesis in the corporate world. I would ask like my, my greatest power in the corporate world was I would walk into manufacturing plants and I would just I would ask questions. I was like, why are we doing this? Like, what's going on over here? Like, why do we do this process this way? Not because I'm trying to be rude or condescending because I'm trying to understand why do we actually do it, <laughs> right? And if they can't clearly articulate to me why we actually do something, it's a really good uh, indicator that maybe we could stop doing it, right? Like maybe there's a whole step in here that we don't need to do. So if I see something, I'm like, I'm going to say something I'm like, why do we do that? Why do we go around the plant three times before we actually, Oh, I don't know. It's just cause we've always done it that way. I'm like, Oh, well, that's not a good enough reason for us to keep doing it. Right. So I really want you to question that for yourself in your own business. As you look at this time tracking, is it something that I could trash? And some of you might be really resistant to the idea of trashing certain things. And so I always tell my clients, you can test, like do a test for like, three weeks, you can trash something. Most importantly, you have to have a metric. If something doesn't have a metric, how do we even know it's valuable to the business anyways, <laughs> right? Like you might just be continuing to do something because you think it's adding value to the business, but I want to at least challenge you to find a metric that shows us it's actually valuable to the business. And so by removing it, even for those three weeks, we can look at that metric and see, is it moving? Is it moving in a positive direction? Is it moving in a negative direction? If it's moving in a negative, once you trashed it, okay, bring it back, right? There's a safety net there. You don't have to trash it forever, but you do have to show me your numbers, right? So can we trash it? And when I say trash it, I mean the entire company is trashing it, not that you're transferring it over to someone else. It means as a company, we just maybe don't need to do this anymore because it's not adding value to our end customers. And that's the only reason we do things is to add value to our end customers. If they won't pay for it, we don't do it. And that was like our in, in the corporate world, when I worked in a pulp and paper plant, like if our customer wouldn't pay for this to happen, then it's probably not necessary. So question it, right? The second thing you can do with that time is you can trim it. So Parkinson's law states that a task will expand or contract with the amount of time that you give it. So that means if you give a meeting an hour, it is going to take an hour. If you give it 30 minutes, it is going to take 30 minutes, right? Same thing with the tasks that are on your plate. A lot of times we just give ourselves unlimited amounts of time to do certain things. And if we would constrain those things and say, you know what, I only have two hours to do this. I'm getting it done by the end of those two hours. Problem for most of us as CEOs, as leaders of our organizations is there's no one holding us accountable for those things. Whereas in school, someone held us accountable to certain deadlines or in you know, the corporate world, managers held us accountable to certain deadlines. So you need to share with your team potentially, hey, I'm, you know, going to get this done by Tuesday, hold me to it, right? And you need to, number one, be accountable to yourself, but also looking at your day, how can you start constraining those things? One of the best ways to um, do this in action and in practice and really start believing it is to well, you can't go to a coffee shop right now, but go somewhere <laughs> away from like your power plugs, bring your computer with no charger 
and watch how efficiently you work. Once that battery gets down to like 20%, you're like, oh my gosh, like no one talked to me. Like I am in the zone. I gotta, I gotta get this done before that, <laughs> that power goes to zero. That's Parkinson's law, right? That's like, you were, you were nonchalant about things beforehand. Now that time has been constrained, you're getting it done and, and become a mom. I have never gotten so much done during a 30 minute nap. Oh my gosh. I'm like, I'm on fire during that 30 minute nap. Why she won't sleep longer. I don't know, but I'm going to get it done. <laughs> right. So that is Parkinson's law, like trimming things. So now I want you to go through that task list and just ask yourself, is there anything on here that we could just trim? Like maybe we still need to do it. We can't totally trash it but we can trim it. We can do less of it. We can constrain it in terms of the hours that we spend. The third way that you can remove or move some of that time off of your plate is you can transfer it. So once we've identified, we can't trash it completely as a company, we still need to do it. Uh, maybe we can trim it a little bit, but can we also transfer it off of your plate individually? So this is where I need you as an individual to ask like, okay, we need to do it as a company, but do I need to be the person that does it? For most of the things on your list, the answer is going to be no. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to be able to transfer them all right away because maybe you don't have the staff to do it. Maybe you don't really know how to transfer it yet because sometimes things take a little bit longer of training to transfer to other people. But I still want you to identify that on that list, wow, here's you know 62 things that by the end of this year, I could transfer off my plate, right? So I want you to identify, does it still need to be done, but maybe it just needs to be done by someone else. And then the last T, which we've added since the book uh, has been published, so this one is not in the book, but treasure it. So what are the things that are on your plate that you truly treasure, or I like to say like the company treasures you doing it, like you are the most valuable person to be doing that activity. So that's probably going to live more in the design time elements, the strategy, the business development, the visionary work. Maybe it's, you know, if you're in real estate, it's the deals that you're finding or something related to the secret sauce that you have that no one else can do on the team, but also that you love doing. It's probably one of the reasons you started this business to begin with. It was the thing that you were like, oh, I love doing this part. And then all of a sudden, a year or two, 10 later, you've got every task on your plate, right? And we're like trying to figure out where, where's the stuff that I actually loved doing? Where's the stuff that I'm best at? And you're gonna classify that, you're gonna identify, okay, here's the things that I really treasure and I really do wanna keep those and it's most valuable to the business for me to keep those. So I want you to identify at least one thing that you need to stop doing that you're gonna to transfer to someone else, right? So when you go through that list, now that we have this doing, here's all the things that I'm doing, it's going to be really hard for you to transfer all of those at once, right? Even from a, from an ego, from a mental standpoint or from a physical like time standpoint to transfer all those things. But if you could transfer one of those things by the end of this week, that would be a win, right? If you could look at that doing list and say, you know what, like that's not really something I need to do. Let me transfer that over to someone else. So how do we actually move people from, staying like stuck in that deciding to fully autonomous and delegated in their roles. I'm going to talk to you about how we go from deciding to delegated. And then that's how you're going to actually move this off of your plate. So there's three reasons that people on your team are not making decisions. And this goes for any level of team, any level of team member, um, this is you, right? Like the uh, Instagrammer taking your photo. You got to get that photo in front of the train, right? Like, and what I mean is that you're, you're usually very risk tolerant. You have a high tolerance for risk as an entrepreneur. Uh, I know this because I am one of you. My husband is not. <laughs> okay. And maybe some of you are married to people that are not as risk tolerant as you and they don't get you sometimes and you have to like really convince them with some of your ideas. If you know anyone like that in your life, even if it's not your significant other or your, your mom or whoever, just know that most of your team members and your employees are also pretty risk averse, right? Like they're actually really nervous about a lot of the things that you do. <laughs> you make them nervous as, as much as they're inspired by you. You also make them really nervous sitting in front of this train. They're like, what is wrong with you? Right? 
but this is how this is our mindset right like we're just going we're willing to do whatever it takes i'm making the decisions i'm doing the thing i don't have all the information but i'm still making a decision right because that's what we got to do so even just understanding their mindset can give you a little bit more empathy for maybe why they're not making some of those decisions because safety and security is probably a higher value for them uh, than it is for you. And they feel unsafe probably in a lot of this is the decisions that maybe you want them to make, but we can make it a really safe environment for them by providing them with permission, information, and confidence, because these are the three reasons they're not making a decision right now. So let me just go through these really, really briefly, and then we'll talk about how to transfer those things over. So permission, right? Have we formally handed over permission of, hey, I want you to make decisions in this area? Because if you haven't, they're probably like, oh, Mike wants to make those decisions because you keep making them, right? So if you keep making those decisions, you're training them that you want to make those decisions. And in the back of your mind, you're like, why don't they just make these decisions? <laughs> because we've never actually given them permission to do so. A lot of times clients will also tell me, Adrian, I gave them permission and they're still not doing it. And I'm like, well, at some point you probably took away that permission when they made the decision and then immediately you changed it to what you wanted. You were like, okay, good job, but actually I want it this way. And what you immediately told them was, I don't actually trust you to make the decisions because you make the wrong ones, right? So we have to fix that through systems and information um, as well as like re-handing over that permission and trusting our people through the systems that we build to make the right decisions for our company. The second one is information. Now this is usually the one, the, the big reason of why people don't make decisions is because they don't actually have the information to make the decision. It's either living in your head, right? Which is probably a lot of stuff that you make decisions around just lives in your head, but we can get it out. Um, or it lives on a Google doc that you just have never shared with them. Or it lives in your email box that they just don't have access to. Or it lives in a bank account that they don't have access to either or whatever it might be, right? They don't have access to the information in order to make a good decision. And so it's really not in their best interest to make that decision. So we have to transfer that information to them effectively. The third reason they're not making the decision is because they're not confident to do so. Usually that stems from not having permission and not having information. If they don't have permission and information, it is really scary to, to make a decision. And us as CEOs who are a little bit more risk tolerant, we're willing to make those decisions. We have the confidence to maybe do that, but they don't. So we need to identify, are they missing permission? Are they missing information? Or are they missing confidence? Lack of confidence can also come from, I had a, a team member who's currently on my team who had some pretty like rough PTSD from a former employer. Like who, like if she made a wrong decision, it was a, a big deal in their company, right? And she would get yelled at and it was traumatic and you know, all these things that came from it. And so I really needed to, build her confidence as a leader, as a mentor. I just needed to acknowledge that that was an area that she was kind of weak in. And it was my job to build her up through small, uh, empowering, you know, communication. Hey, you're doing a great job. That was a great decision. Even if it was like what she ordered me for lunch. I'm like, that's awesome. I love that thing. Even if I hated it, right? It doesn't matter. Sometimes you just suck it up <laughs> because you know the person needs some confidence. And if we really want them to be able to run this company in the future and be able to uh, operate it without us, then we have to get comfortable with just swallowing, you know, some bad lunch every now and then. Every now and then I get a phone call from a client and they're trying to find financing for a gas station or something unconventional like um, storage facility. The first name that always comes to mind is our great sponsor, Billy Brown. BillyBrown.me. That's BillyBrown.me. He is a fantastic creative lender. Correct. And can help investors just like you solve any creative lending issues. Maybe you have bad credit. Maybe you have defaulted on loans in the past, or maybe you just don't have the uh, the history operating properties mm -hmm. to be able to qualify for a big Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan. They're great at just focusing on the asset more than the borrower himself. So, I mean, call him to pick his brain. He's always willing uh, to talk to anybody. You would love just talking to him and find, finding out about different ways to be able to finance your investment. Yeah, so Billy Brown, that's billybrown.me. Check him out. 
So how do we effectively delegate this stuff? Well, it's exactly what we talked about. We're gonna hand it over properly with what I call our IPO framework, okay? So we're gonna make this stuff public, IPO, right? So information. So when you transfer something over, so remember you identify, you're gonna identify that one task from your doing section and you're going to transfer it over to someone this week. But you can't just say, hey, go do this thing now for me. Now we gotta, we gotta actually do this a little bit more formally so that it doesn't end up back on your plate or so that you don't get pissed off that they did it wrong, right? That's usually what happens. Oh, they didn't do it the way I wanted them to do it. Well, then we didn't delegate it as effectively as we could have. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna go through this as we transfer this thing over. What resources or information will they need to accomplish this or to make good decisions in this area? Do this with them, right? Because they might identify things that, um, that you are not even aware of that maybe they don't have the information for, or maybe there's a decision that you usually make that they can just talk you through and understand why you're making that decision. Because every decision that you make, there is a reason that you're making it. Even if you, even if you make it in like a split second, there is a reason that you're making that decision. It might be you've had 10 years experience, but your brain is literally running through a decision tree. It just does it so fast that you don't even think about it. So if we would just slow down and they could ask you some questions of like, okay, well, why, like if, if this was actually, um, when I went to Disney World like four years ago, um, there was a decision tree matrix hanging up inside one of the tellers booths. And I was like, oh my God, that's one of our tools. We, we teach decision trees and getting this information out of your head through a decision tree. And, and the scenario was um, if someone, uh, you know, shows up and they are requesting um, access, like VIP access, do we give it to them? So instead of having to call a manager, because how annoying is that? Like if you've ever been a customer on the customer end, it's super annoying if the person you're dealing with can't make a decision for you. So I want you to think about that from your customer's perspective. How often are they getting told like, oh, actually I need to go talk to Seth or oh, actually, can you wait? Like I need to go, you know, get more information on that before I can give you a decision or I'm not qualified to make that decision. It's like, if you've ever called a cell phone company or it's so frustrating, right? So what we can do is identify what are the decisions that that manager is running through that you could just put on a decision tree, right? So how can they make good decisions? What resources or information do they need from you? The second one is permission, right? So think about what permission do they need to really fully own this role for them to be able to make decisions, for them to take responsibility. And that, like I said, it could be access to certain things. It also could just be you saying, hey, this is the area I feel comfortable with you making decisions in. Here's the few things I don't feel comfortable with you making decisions on yet. We'll get to that point, but if you could just still run these three things by me, that would be great, but everything else, you got it, right? Can you formally give them some permission over about this role or this specific task that you're gonna be transferring? And then the outcome. This one is the most important thing for you to think about. What is the outcome criteria of this project or this role? How will we know when it's complete and how will they know that they've been successful? Your team members want to know that they're doing a good job. And oftentimes we don't give them the tools to know whether they're doing a good job or not. So we talk about the idea of everyone having uh, metrics within their, their role, right? So you're gonna have a, they're gonna have a role that they play within your company and there's gonna be a metric associated with that. When you can help them identify what those metrics are that you're looking for, they will be so much more capable of being autonomous in that role and making more decisions around it because they know where they're going, they know what they're being measured against. And most people want that. Most people want to know that they're doing a good job or that they're not so that they can help course correct it. But too often in small businesses, we don't give them that. We just give them task, 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 task. How do they know if they're doing a good job? They're wondering like, hey, are they, gonna, are they gonna tell me if I'm doing a good job or not? Maybe they'll tell me at the end of the year, <laughs> right? Like, How scary is that as a team member? So give them an outcome for this thing that you're transferring so that they know, okay, this is what a completion of this project looks like, or this is how I know that I'm doing a good job. It could be a metric. Uh, you know, I want X number of sales on this thing, or I want X number 
number of new Instagram followers. You guys are going to learn about Instagram next month. So like maybe there's certain metrics that you are actually outsourcing to them. I want you to outsource the metric. I want you to outsource the outcome to them so that they know when they're, when they're being successful, when they're done, and if they're even moving in the right direction. So I have just some quick tips and then I'll take questions. I know that this um, definitely is stuff that we talk about in the book, but we went way beyond the book in this section too. And this is just the first step of clockworking, right? So this is, this is the first piece of moving your business in that direction. So I definitely want you to keep, you know, go read the book and, and get the rest. But if I can answer any other questions, but just some quick tips for you while you think about any questions that you have, be willing to accept support. So I think a, a lot of times as we um, run and grow businesses, one of the things that I, I see very frequently from CEOs is they think they want help, but then when help is there, they don't, they don't receive it. <laughs> they don't let people help them. They want to do it all, or they think that they can do it better, right? Um, which, is, which is your ego at play there. And we're looking for people that can actually do this stuff better than you, right? Because right now, if you're split focus on all those different things that you write on that board, think about how much more effective it's going to be if someone could actually focus on that thing, on that one thing or that one project area. Right now, you're trying to be all the things and you're probably not as great at it. Another thing that I see people do is when they don't like a task or when they think a task is annoying or monotonous, they tend to feel guilty about passing it off to someone else. <laughs> they're like, they're like, oh, I hate doing this task. Like if I pass it off to Jenny, like she's, she's not gonna, she's gonna wanna quit. She's gonna hate working here because this task is awful. So I'm just gonna keep doing it. <laughs> Maybe some of you don't have that problem, which is great. But I know I had that problem with a few different things. And now that I have delegated some of those things, I've realized that actually there are certain people that love doing those things that I hate doing. <laughs> they're better at it. And they actually, it's in their strengths and it's just not in mine. Like, do not ask me to answer the support inbox. Like, I'm not an empathetic person. I'm not good in our support email. Someone tells me, you know, that they had a bad day or they didn't finish the coursework and whatever. Like, I'm just not empathetic to that email response. But I have team members now that do that and they do it really, really well. So just keep me out of there and they love it. Number two is adjust your expectations. So oftentimes we have expectations that someone is going to come on board and immediately they're going to be able to, you know, get transferred all of this stuff and they're going to be rocking their role and they're not going to, not going to make any mistakes and they're going to totally know how to read your mind. And that is an expectation that usually leads to that person getting fired in a few months. We think, oh, they just don't get it. Like they're not fast enough. They're not getting it when we haven't actually spent enough time transferring things over properly so that they actually have the opportunity to get it, right? Like, are we effectively delegating to them? Are we outsourcing the outcome? Are we giving them permission? Are we giving them enough information to actually do their job? Um, and if we've done that, then, um, and then they're still not a good fit, that's fine. But most of the time I see people saying that they, someone is not a good fit and it's usually because our expectations are a little bit skewed. And then the third thing is start with the right tasks. So when you transfer things over, if it feels a little scary for you to transfer things over, I want you to start with things that are low stakes. Don't give them like the things that are closest to the money right away. Don't give them things that are going to break your business right away. Cause that's number one, really scary for you. Um, also really scary for them. Gives them an opportunity to fail at something that is not an area you want them to, to fail at right away because they need to build that confidence by doing the low stakes things that feel safer, where you can start building trust in them, they can build confidence in themselves, it's not gonna break the business if they don't do the best job right away, right? Do things that are simple, because that way we're getting these small wins, which will motivate them, it will also motivate you to start handing things over. Once I started handing things over and delegating more effectively, it became like an addiction. I was like, what else can I get off my plate, right? Like now that, oh my God, you're doing such a great job at this. Like, let me hand this over to you. Let me hand this over to you. So do things that are simple so that you can get those small wins. Um, and then it will become second nature for the both of you and for the entire team. And then the third one is easy to capture. So inside the book, we talk about this idea of capturing systems. It's our fourth step inside the book. 
And capturing systems means instead of writing this like super long SOP standard operating procedure where step one, we do this, step two, we do this. That's really boring and monotonous. And usually it's obsolete within you know, weeks to months because technology has changed or there's a different way to do things or you miss a step because you forgot to write it down. We want you to capture things via video. So just like we're here on Zoom, as you do tasks in the business, capture them, talk yourself through actually doing them. Now you have a process that you can easily hand over to someone else because this is usually one of the big barriers when people are trying to transfer or even trying to hire. They're like, oh, I really need some support, but I don't have the time to train someone. And I'm like, well, the next time you do this task, I want you to record yourself doing it. I like, don't tell me that you can't record yourself doing it either because I have had people that run like gymnastics studios and they have set up cameras and they've literally talked through gymnastics moves, right? Like you can do this, whether you run an in-person brick and mortar physical business, we've worked with restaurants, we've worked with doctors, lawyers, you name it. You can record yourself doing the process, even if it's not computer based. Okay. So use your phone if you need to. Um, but capture yourself doing the process so that you can easily hand it over to someone else. And now you've started the documentation of your systems. You're just capturing what you're doing as you're doing it. It doesn't take any more time. You're also sure to not miss a step because oftentimes we go through the things that we're doing so quickly because it's second nature. But if you're actually doing it, it's impossible for you to miss a step. Even if you don't talk through that step, someone could still go back to the recording and be like, oh, wait, how did they do that? And they could pause it and, and look at, see what you're doing. So start transferring things that are easy to capture because that will motivate you to actually just hand it over. And then establish a good communication cadence. So what I mean by that is like, we got to talk to people. We got to understand what's working for them, what's not working for them, especially in this digital world that we're living in right now. I foresee a lot of companies that have gone virtual. I foresee them staying virtual after this. You're realizing you can be even more lean with your company by not paying for the overhead of a building potentially if you don't need to. Um, but even if you are in person um, or virtual, just make sure that you're talking to your people and especially as you start transferring things over, have a regular check-in that you're doing either at the end of the day, here's what I did today, here's, here's what my concerns are about the project that I'm working on, um, and here's what I'm working on tomorrow. That way you can help uh, recorrect or like help reprioritize anything that they're working on that maybe you're like, mm, that's not really a good priority, um, or they have, a, they have a space to share concerns with you. Here's my concern, I don't really have the information to do this. Oh, perfect, let me be able to get that to you. And sometimes they just don't have the communication uh, channel to do that with you. So making sure that you are speaking with them. So I promise you that your team members don't want to disappoint you. It's just that we haven't really given them the tools and the permission to be more autonomous and to support you and to help you design this business that can run itself. And running a business itself doesn't mean just setting things up on autopilot and you know using all the automation that we have. Automation is amazing, but it will never replace humans inside of your company. You still need people there and you still need systems for them to operate within. So hopefully this gives you at least one starting point for you guys to jump off of this week. Um, so pick one thing that you're doing and I want you to actually create that plan, the, the information permission outcome plan to delegate this over to an individual that's on your team. Or if you don't have them on the team yet, you can, you can still create this plan for when they get there, right? So, so, so think about your business, the business that you want, right? Start creating the tools and the systems for the business that you want. Even if you don't have this person yet, if you develop this system, as soon as they come on board, it's ready and waiting for them to transfer over to them. So the, the, the last thing that I have here is like the quick start guide that we have. It goes through all of the steps of clockwork. If you guys want it, it's free. Also, Seth, I will send you over the, um, the spreadsheets so that you guys, if you want to do your time tracking, I highly encourage you to do it. I always tell my clients that it's something that you can't unsee. Like that will change you alone just from acknowledging where your time is actually going. You will be like, oh my God look at how much time I spend answering questions all day or look at how much time I spend distracted in, you know, in the news or 
with phone calls or whatever notifications, whatever it is, it's just going to show you the reality of what's happening, which is a very powerful thing to shift the future. So that's all I got. Yeah. Got questions or. As a real estate broker, I recommend to anybody that's about to purchase an asset, whether it's a, a primary residence or an investment property, to always get a home inspector to go check that property for anything that might be wrong with it. Kind of a no-brainer, but it's one of those things that I think a lot of people cheap out on. They want the cheapest guy, not always who's the best guy. Dave Ganatra with House on the Rock Home Inspections, he will get in there and find every single thing that could be potentially wrong with your place that you're about to buy. I am telling you, he will get in that crawl space, man. He will fight a raccoon for you. Yes. So you can check him out, Dave Ganatra, at House on the Rock Home Inspections. That's H-O-T-R-Inspections.com. Again, H-O-T-R-Inspections.com. Yeah. So good. Hey, thank you so much, Adrian. This this You're was welcome. awesome. I've been I've been taking uh, pages and pages of notes. Oh, good. So, um, I'll, I'll kick us off with some questions. Obviously, if if people are watching in on either our Facebook page or on Zoom, just type them in the chat, type them in the comments, and I'll relay the questions. Um, Adrian should see them as well too. But. Um, my first question is kind of with the time tracking to follow up on that. Um, I know the idea of doing that to a lot of people sounds really daunting. So I, I like the idea that you, you kind of put it in a, you know, a five day Wiki framework. Version. Yeah. <laughs> so what does that actually look like? Like how do people do it while still actually getting things done? Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a mindset that you have to go into that week with. And we and our clients time track once a quarter for five days, every single quarter, because every single quarter, there's new things that end up on my plate that need to be transferred, you know? So I understand, I feel the pain of it, but it always shows me the reality of what's going on in our business. So it's always worth it. So I will say that it's, you know, often frustrating during the, during the week um, to do it, but I go into that week kind of prepared. We all prepare our own spreadsheet in advance. I keep it open on my computer. And what I usually do is every time that I'm going to switch tasks, I go in and write down start time, stop time. What did I do? the things that are usually really hard to capture are the deciding, right? Like when someone calls me or when someone, um, we use Slack. I don't know if people use Slack, but it's like a communication kind of chat channel for our team because we're all remote. So Slack can be one where people are just messaging all day long and that's deciding. So what I go into Slack, I do at the end, I do that at the end of the day because I don't want to be like every time someone asks me a question in Slack, I'm, you know, writing it down necessarily, but some, sometimes people that works for them at the end of the day, I go back and I look at the timestamps on Slack. Where did, where did I start this conversation? Where did I stop it? Um, with the, with that specific team member. And I put that in as usually deciding. Um, and then the first thing I usually do at the beginning of the week is I go through my calendar and I go ahead and put all of my calls or meetings. I go ahead and time track those right away. And then I just adjust if a meeting ended early or went late, I'll just adjust the time on it because at least you have a jumping point for a good chunk of your week, potentially of like meetings or calls or, you know, clients or whatever, you know, you've got on the schedule and then you don't have to, you know, write those in, um, each time, but adjust the, um, time. The other thing that I noticed during my last time tracking was, um, I'm doing a lot more work from my phone being a new mama. <laughs> so being more mindful, this, this is something I'm going to be doing during my next time tracking is being more mindful of tracking the work that's happening on my phone. And so I'll also have my spreadsheet open and like pinned inside my Slack. So it's easy to access and get to. Um, but like when I, you know, I'm breastfeeding and I'm sitting there answering questions for people or, or responding to emails, right? Like that is work that I'm doing that I need to classify. So just being mindful of that. I think that it's always going to be a little bit painful, but just know that it is really important data to shift this stuff off your plate, right? Like if we don't know that it's happening, there's no way that we can help you shift it off and move it in the right direction. So being as diligent as you can, if you work in an in-person setting, like 
I've done this with doctor's offices and the nurses literally use pieces of paper. They, every time that they shift a task, they go back, they might have to just remember, you know, the last three things that they did and they might guesstimate the time a little bit, but guess what? Like do your best and forget the rest. At least we have a good sample size of data by the end of the week. That's why we have you do five days. Yeah. That's, that's so good. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, You're welcome. So much good stuff there. Um, so uh, as a team leader, let's say business owner, what do you think is the hardest thing when, when a business owner says, well, I know that I can do this. I'm the best at doing this. How am I, how can I surrender this and let go? What is, what is the, how do you help them get through that? Let's say even fear of like, nobody's going to do this as good as I am. How am I going to go anywhere for, let's not even say four weeks, let's say like one day in some cases. So, yeah. so how, how, what is the biggest mental block that you see? And then how do you smash that? Yeah, I mean, that is the biggest thing, right? Like no one could do this as, as well as me. Um, no one could be able to, no one could possibly answer these questions for other people. No one could possibly take care of my clients or, you know, do this. They don't want to talk to me. They don't want to talk to you. They want to talk to me. Talk to me. No one wants to do business with anyone else besides me. There's no way I can transfer my clients. I've literally transferred uh, doctors, patients who have been with them for four years over to another doctor, right? It, I'll, I will say this. This stuff takes time. We tell you in this book, it is not a quick fix, right? Like this is a 12 to 18 month plan for your business because it does take time. And we have to identify those key areas that maybe you do own a lot of the intellectual property around, or maybe you are the one with the most expertise. But I always tell my, my clients, you were not born knowing this, were you? Like you didn't, you didn't come out the womb knowing this innately. Like maybe you're a little bit, more wired for those strengths but these are things that the information that you have that you feel no one else has is because we've never transferred it to them so we can find someone if you don't have them on the team already that has some of those talents or strengths that need to need to be involved in order to do that well and then we get to transfer all the information that you have over to them slowly, surely, right? Like over time, it's not going to be overnight. Um, and like I said, don't give them those high stakes things right away. You have to build the trust in those people. Cause I agree. You're not going to leave tomorrow, right? It takes right. 12 to 18 months for our clients to go on their four week vacation, sometimes six months, depending on what, you know, what they've already got done inside of the business when they come to us, but it takes time, it takes discipline because you have to continue to remind yourself what you really want for yourself because it's really easy to pull things back onto your plate. It's really easy to say, that's not the decision I would have made. So it's safer for me to just keep all these things to myself. Right. Um, and a ton of fear comes up for people once they start getting closer and closer to that vacation day, they're like, I don't really want to go on vacation. I don't really need to, right? I don't really need that time. What am I going to do? Because a lot of times our identity as a CEO, as an entrepreneur is wrapped up in the doing. It is wrapped up in the high achieving. It is wrapped up in who am I if I'm not doing? And what will people think of me if I'm not doing? Yeah, will my team think I'm lazy, right? Can this be done without a coach like you or a company like yours? Can just a regular person say, hey, I got my business. I'm going to follow uh, this, 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 yes. and that, and, and I can do this. Yes. And that's what I love. Like, I would say 100% get, get the book. If you want to do this on your own, we have so many success stories of people that message us. They email us. Mike just emailed me one two days ago. Someone I have never heard of. They're a reader of this book. And they said, I went on my four-week vacation. Thank you so much. You know, like you don't need me, but there are people that want more support and that's what we do. But for sure, like that's why I love Mike's books because he writes them with the intention that you will apply this on your own and you can. And, you, and we have seen clients do, or, you know, readers do it even without working with us. And that to me is the most rewarding thing is like, like I don't care how you get there to your four week vacation with me, without me reading the book, you know, listening to the book every night before you go to bed as your Bible, whatever you need to do, 
uh, just get to that goal because it is so liberating to have that freedom because you never know when something could happen to you, unfortunately. And I've unfortunately heard so many stories from entrepreneurs who feel invincible, who feel they will never be taken down, right? And they've got cancer or their kid is sick or they have a parent they need to take care of or whatever it is. And it's heartbreaking (laughs) to hear that they're so wrapped up in their business that they can't take care of themselves or they have to shut the business down because they have to go take care of their health or whatever it is. And that's their main income. And so I don't want you to get to that point. And sometimes we don't think of these things until it's too late, but hopefully this, um, you know, motivates you to at least start removing yourself. And I, I call it like you're probably basket woven into everything inside the business. And we just have to like start unweaving you <laughs> as that basket. Yeah. Well, to kind of piggyback off of that too, one, one of our questions from Jeff on, on Zoom, do you or your company provide coaching to help people through this process? Yes. So we have a program. It's called the Accelerator. It's 12 weeks um, plus a two-day virtual event that Mike and I host together. It's super high touch. We handhold you. You get a clockwork mentor, um, multiple group calls a week, but we have a system that we walk you and your team through so your team gets we want your team to join that program because i need you to buy in as a leader of like what we're doing so that you don't undo everything (laughs) that your team's trying to do but effectively if you have a team and they're helping you with the clockwork process it's going to go way faster and it's going to be way more effective because they're the people that are doing the work and teams get so fired up to to do this because a lot of times as Uh, entrepreneurs, we go to these conferences, we have great ideas, but they're not brought in on this stuff. And they're trying to execute this stuff that we have all these ideas about. And we have new ideas every single day. And they're like, when are we actually going to do one of those? (laughs) Right? Like, remember when you said, went to that training, you were really fired up, like, can we can we actually follow through on that? And so by bringing the team in on the process, we find that that works way better, much more quickly helps keep you accountable. um, and we do that inside of our clockwork program. You can find it all on our website too, if you're interested in, in joining us, we'd love to have you. Awesome. And is the, the, the link that you posted again, um, that is uh, runlikeclockwork.com slash quick start. That's our free guide. So it goes through um, all of the clockwork steps that we have inside the book. So to give you like a quick here's what you need to do step one, here's what you need to do step two. So that'll give you kind of a framework. And what we do inside of our program is help you actually apply each of those steps to your business. So once you get the quick start guide, you'll have our email, you know, you'll be on our email list. And if you want more info, you can always email our team too. Awesome. And, and I know for a lot of people out there who are watching, who are maybe, you know, maybe even solopreneurs, one person, two person, three person operations, does clockwork as a system work for small teams or or solopreneurs as well? It works for small teams 100%. I would say the majority of our clients are somewhere between three and 15 team members. We have up to 50. We have a a couple teams with up to 50. and anywhere from usually multi six figures to uh, 10, you know, just it, go, it goes up there just depending on the business model for sure in terms of what, what their revenue is. So it works for everyone. Solopreneurs, I will say, you have to be willing to eventually hire some support if you want this system to work. You can't be the type of solopreneur who says, I wanna be solo and I wanna be solo forever. Like, well then and what i mean by that is you don't ever have to have full time or part time but you do need to eventually even use some contractors if that's if that's the route you want to take and we don't dictate which route you take but you do need to be willing to get some support otherwise there will be no nowhere to transfer certain certain things um but it would still be effective for you in terms of trashing and trimming like those are things you could still be doing with your with your time more effectively so that you're spending your time in the more valuable places so we always start our solopreneurs off with that like what can you trash what can you trim and then how can you spend that freed up time 
more effectively throughout the week because that will grow your business, which might make you more comfortable with hiring that first person, right? So once they start seeing the fruits of that trash and trim, now they're like, oh, maybe I could hire someone for three hours a week and now I can start transferring. And then it becomes this snowball effect, right? It's like the Dave Ramsey snowball effect, but for your time. <laughs> yeah. Well, time is the most valuable thing for, for all of us. So I think what you guys are doing is absolutely amazing. Like I said, I, I, I read a ton of books and this is definitely by far one of the best, um, you. you know, business books systems that I have uh, come across. So it, it definitely works. Um, I would ask, you know, just as, as kind of a follow up to some of the, you know, transfer uh, trash. What are some examples? Because as you're just going through your presentation in my mind, I'm like, okay, well, nobody should technically be doing quote trash it activities. But what are some common examples of, of those type of things that, that you yeah. I mean, it's surprising what we can trash, but usually the first thing that, you know, I look to trash is meetings. A lot of times meetings get on our calendar because they've always been there, especially like recurring meetings or things that, you know, could be done in an email, right? Like, or done in a, in a quick message, doesn't need a 30 minute meeting. So we can potentially trash those. Um, so identifying, is there a purpose to this? Like no one gets to book a meeting on my calendar unless there is a clear purpose. Like does Adrian actually need to be there or can the team do this without her? So that's something I might be able to trash off of my plate completely. Um, we've had clients trash entire revenue streams. We've trashed entire revenue streams. We've been, we, once we look at our data. So once you get this, this, you know, time tracking done, you can start seeing like, wow, a huge chunk of my time goes to this thing. And then you can start matching that up with your metrics. Is this really a good use of my time, <laughs> right? Like in terms of the revenue it's bringing in or in terms of the profitability of that actual product or that actual revenue stream? Is that a good use of my time? And if not, what if I took those 10 hours a week that I'm spending on this thing and I put it towards the thing that is 25% more profitable? Could I just make that thing way more profitable and remove this entire revenue stream or remove this entire product line. Like we've had clients who had 53 SKUs and they went down to 12, right? So they trashed, you know, the majority of their products that they were selling and they grew their business in the process of doing that. So you can go as big as trash an entire revenue stream to as small as trash a meeting because maybe it's not really worth your time. Um, same thing with trimming, right? Trimming, we've had people do the same thing where they trim certain revenue streams where they look at a product and they're like, uh, especially in the coaching, consulting, service-based stuff, you can start thinking, um, are we doing the least amount of things that we possibly can to get them the most amount of results, right? That's what efficiency is. Like, how do we do the least and get the most out of it. And that goes for the products and services that you provide too. Even as a coach, a trainer, a consultant, the things that I'm looking at, I'm looking at our programs and I'm saying, do we really need to do that call with them? If they're not attending the call, then clearly it's not valuable. So let's stop doing that call and save some of that time. Let's trim it. Or maybe that call only needs to be 30 minutes instead of 60, right? Um, so we actually lean down our products too, because I always want to be thinking, I don't want to overwhelm people with more and more things to do. It's the last thing my clients need. They need to know what is the least amount that they need to do to get the result that they're looking for. And so I'm constantly trying to like even lean our own product lines um, and the like the assets that we provide or the, um, you know, the resources inside there. Same thing like with trimming. I think trimming works the best when you're constraining. So for me, it will take me four days if I give myself four days to create webinar slides, right? Because I got to go back, I got to perfect it, I got to do this or emails maybe that I'm sending to our email marketing list. Like that could take me days if I let it. But instead I give myself three, here's three hours, Adrian, you you got three hours to write these emails, then they need to be done and they need to be handed off, right? Um, those are ways that you can start constraining and trimming 
so that you're not spending as much time on those things as well as like we have clients who trim their social media where they're they're using their metrics and they're like okay i'm showing up on all five of these channels but i'm not really doing any of them really well so i'm going to trim this for now i'm only going to show up on instagram i'm going to do instagram really freaking well and then once i've got that down and there's a system there and I can hand that system off to someone else, then I'm going to go master YouTube. Then I'm going to go, you know, instead of trying to do it all at once. So those are just like some examples of trimming, but you can do it. I mean, in any type of business, we've done this with a dentist where we trimmed the way that he does root canals. He was in there for the entire time before. Now we have uh, a nurse practitioner who preps. She gets the patient all the way up to the point where he comes in, literally the root canal takes less than 10 minutes to do the actual root canal part, part, part. Then someone comes back on the back end, stitches him up, does all the prep work, does the, you know, outboarding. Um, he's in there for 15 minutes and he batches them on certain days because it's when you're in the same mindset of like, I'm doing root canals today. I'm doing root canals today. He goes from one room to the next root canal, root canal, root canal. He can do them much more efficiently than if he had a root canal. And then he had to go, wait, what's my next patient doing? What do I need to do for them? So even just batching those like tasks on the same days can trim and make you more efficient actually doing them. Yeah. Well, I can think of a lot of examples in, you know, if people are in real estate, um, you know, there, there, there's a lot of crossovers to that. Cause I mean, in, in real estate, there's a few probably categories of, tasks that you do if you're a broker or an agent so batching them um as far as the just you know covid and this whole crisis of people working from home and there's teams that are working remotely have you had to kind of adapt these principles or, or how, like how has that affected you and your company and maybe some of the, the companies that you're working in and just some kind of takeaways that we can um, maybe take it for people who are struggling with finding what finding finding efficiency in this new normal. Hmm. So right now, like we were always virtual, but I, I am like being more mindful of the, life that my team members are currently living, um, which means that they may have had touch points with people at their gym, with, you know, friends and family, and, you know, they're, they're going to their kids' schools and all of that. And now they're in this world where I might be the only person other than the people that they live with that they talk to all week. And same thing for my clients. So we have actually increased our communication during this season, especially virtually. If you weren't virtual before, and now you're virtual, it can be really tempting to just be like, oh, we all work virtual, we don't have to talk. Or the opposite, where you just sit on Zoom meetings all day, which is really inefficient, right? So we want to be mindful of that, but I have added, usually we have one team meeting a week. Now I've added a team meeting on Wednesdays and Thursdays, I mean, Wednesdays and Fridays as well. So we have Monday, our main one, and then we have a quick check-in on Wednesday, a quick check-in on Friday. I do that because mental health basically like i want to make sure the mental health of my team members that i'm constantly communicating with them throughout the week checking in on how they're doing making sure they're not overworking because they also have my whole team has kids at home with them they're trying to homeschool their kids um so i also need to adjust my expectations and i want to communicate my i have a team full of high achievers i need to communicate to them hey what you were working like in the last season is not what you will be working like in this season because I wanna preserve you for the long haul and I do not know how long you will be homeschooling your children and trying to work for me. <laughs> and I wanna make sure that you're able to do both of those things and not lose your mind. So we've had more frequent communication which has made us actually more efficient, right? So sometimes things in a new season are they were historically inefficient. Now that's making us more efficient to do that. And so I would always like continue to question, right? I was talking about this on a podcast episode where I used to try to batch all of my calls on one day, two days a week. So I would do Mondays and Thursdays, all of my calls. I would tell my team, book as many of my calls on those two days because on Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, I don't want any calls. I want to be able to like dive into the other work I need to do. Now that I have a small 
human at home with me and I have no child care. <laughs> my child care ripped away from me by week four with a baby, <laughs> new baby, first time mom, no family to help us. Right. So I'm like, uh, what am I going to do? I'm, I can't be on calls all day. Right. So now I have my team booking one to two calls max a day because she, when she's down for a nap, I can get on a call. Like my husband takes her while he's not working. Um, but that's what is efficient for me in this season. And so I think questioning for yourself, like, don't just like try to, to be a, a bowl with this and just make it work. Like really look at, okay, that's what used to work for me, but that's not my life anymore. <laughs> just like Mike was saying at the beginning of this, like, I think our lives are going to be very different. Even after this, I think we're going to be walking into a new world, which means your business is going to be operating in that new world. So what was efficient for you previously may not be efficient anymore, which is why it's a really good time to do a time tracking. You might be all over the place right now and that's okay, but it's not okay for us to just accept it and stay that way. We have to start creating new habits, new systems, new ways to be efficient with the current life that you live, right? There also has to be some acceptance around that. I think that we're all a little bit resistant to accepting that this is our normal right now. And I think that the sooner you accept, this is what it is. So what are we going to do with it? And how can I, how can I just look at this and, and do my best and forget the rest, right? So good. Um, man, so much good stuff. Uh, I, I do want to urge people again, um, go over to runlikeclockwork.com and also check out the podcast too. I'm, I'm a big fan of it. Okay. Um, people can check that out wherever they listen to podcasts. Um, it's just, it's just called search run like clockwork, right? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Try to keep awesome. it easy. Run like clockwork. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, I love it. Michael, you got anything else on your end? Oh, my, my mind has clockworks working like <laughs> you got the gears going now. Literally like I'd had to bring myself back to, cause you were talking and I'm in my mind's like, Oh, I can, Crash this. Good. Do this. Okay. I got this. I was like, this guy would be great at this thing that I do. That's <laughs> right. Reality again. That's right. When you go down that list, that's a great point, Mike. Go down that list of things that you're doing and start identifying. If you have people already on your team, like write their name next to it. They would be great at this. They would be great at this. Like and and start transferring things over to them they want to, to have the responsibility they feel so good when you trust them right like if everyone anyone has ever trusted you with doing something that you value so much it feels so good to be trusted and your team wants that for you they want you to be able to trust them uh, and sometimes we just aren't letting them so start handing some of those things over what encouragement uh, would you have for um women that sit in in like you know roles of leadership that that are developers realtors whatever they have and they have their kids so what 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 do you tell them you know i mean this time is 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 wild right now and i feel for people because i'm feeling it myself right and i think that mamas usually get the the brunt of the home work and the support that we have to give our children whether that's because the husband isn't able to or just because the kids kind of demand it i have a four month old and she demands mama sometimes right like she just won't go and i'm like all the time. i don't think it's even sometimes it's like all the, all the time yes all the time right and so just by nature we kind of are you know needed a little bit more in that area as well and so i think that again acceptance for what this season is and knowing this season will not last forever, but by you prioritizing, like what, what are the most important things for you to do as the leader of this organization? And who can you trust to do some of the other things that you can just hand over, that you can say, you know what, even if it's not 100%, even 85% is, is better than nothing. And one of the things that I often do, especially if there's something that I, I need to get done, but I don't necessarily trust the person yet to do it fully and like to completion. I'll have them do it 80% of the way. I'll say, do your best, like do whatever you can on this, like write this email or, you know, prepare this thing for me. Do, do your best with the information that you have. And then I'll come back through and I'll record a video of like, change this, do this, 
edit this, right? I, I give like my 5% feedback on how to improve it. And then they take it the rest of the way. So oftentimes we think we need to just do the hundred percent when actually there's people that could still support us in a safe way to get it to a hundred percent with that review that I could give on my breastfeeding break or whatever it is. But I think that, you know, what you need to re remind yourself is, is like, do your best, forget the rest, know that like this won't last forever, but it is so critical for you to identify what are the things that only you can do. Only I can be on this training tonight, right? Like Seth, Seth wants to talk to me, not my team, who's, you know, able to do everything else inside the company and, and prep all, all the things that I need to do this training. Um, but this is one of those things that's like, okay, this is treasure. This is one of the things that Adrian needs to do. So being really critical with, with your time tracking and looking at that, whether you're a man or a woman, a mom or, or not, I think that we're all being challenged by this time, but um, obviously I'm, I'm pro female entrepreneurs. So we can't, we can't just let this time put us, you know, into a position where we lie down on our back and say, Oh, guess I can't do it. Like, no, you are going to get it done. You're the most efficient person that I know every mom in the world. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That's so good. Hey, well, speaking of which I know you've, you've got, um, you've got a, a little four month old. We really, really appreciate your time Thank you. and you carving out time to be with us on music and money investors group. I know I was looking um, forward to being in Tennessee with you, but this is the, the next best thing. So thank you for having me. It worked. It worked so good. That's absolutely right. And we'll make sure to send links. Um, we will send out a replay of this to our people on our text list and to our email list. And um, we'll make sure to give them a copy of the slides tomorrow as well, too. So if they're on our text list, we will send those out. Um, one question from somebody on Facebook, if they did want to get that Excel sheet to track time, is that something you'd be able to send to us and we can, we can pass on to, the, on to our, our people? Yes, I will send that to you along with the slides. So they have that. Um, it, it, it's a master copy. So you guys will just need to make a copy of it for yourself and it will auto populate all of the metrics and, and data that we have in on there. Awesome. Very cool. Well, Adrian, thank you so much again. Thanks and um, yeah, really, really appreciate you and your time. I appreciate you guys and keep me posted on how I can help you run like clockwork in the future. So absolutely. Don't you just wish you could save more money in taxes every year? Michael, I wish every year that that was going to be the case. So how do I save money? Oh, my recommendation would be to find a CPA that's also great at everything real estate related that understands real estate investment. Chris Picurio with Integrated Financial Group. He is an absolutely amazing CPA and it's official sponsor of the Nashville Investors Podcast. If you guys are real estate investors looking to save money on taxes and make sure that you're properly structured, I think you can speak from personal experience saying that our listeners should go to integratedfg.com and connect with Chris Picurio. Hey, thanks for learning with us today on the show. We would love to meet you at one of our free monthly meetups in Middle Tennessee. Hit the thumbs up button if you like the content. Make sure you hit subscribe so you don't miss a thing on this channel. Check out another awesome investing video here.